Hi guys, Vince here again with the Tinkerer's Workshop. Uh, I just got back a couple weeks ago from Iron Fest 2019. And if you're not familiar with Iron Fest, it's a yearly gathering of uh, forum members from the old woodworking machinery OWWM.org uh, website or forum. And what it is is a gathering just of, of people that are interested in vintage woodworking machinery, uh, collecting it, restoring it, using it. And every year we get together in Union, Illinois and just swap stories about machinery restorations. Uh, we usually have a few demos and then on Saturday morning there's a swap meet. And I typically come home with a truckload of parts or tools. I uh, didn't get quite as much this year, but I did pick up a couple of, of nice items that I thought I'd share with you. And the first of those is this Atlas 12-inch bandsaw. Uh, I had been looking for one of these for a while. The Atlas 12-inch bandsaws were kind of regarded as one of the better 12-inch saws that were on the market. Even though it's a fairly small saw, comparatively, they're made very well and they're made as rugged as some of the larger saws. So this one's got a cast iron frame and just a lot of nice features on it for, uh, for a smaller saw. This one even came with a belt guard, which you don't see too often. Uh, it fits on the back of the saw to cover the pulley and the drive belt. Um, this one needs a little bit of work. It's rusty and obviously needs a paint job, but all the parts are there, so I think it'll be a good candidate for restoration. Uh, I've got a couple other large items that I haven't brought down into my basement yet, so I'm going to head out to the garage and we'll take a look at those there. All right, we're in my garage uh, looking at a couple of the bigger items. Uh, one of the first things I picked up at Iron Fist this year was this Delta scroll saw stand. Uh, about a year ago, I bought a Delta 24-inch scroll saw on Craigslist. Uh, nice, nice old, older scroll saw, but it didn't have a stand. So when I got to the swap meet at Iron Fist this year, I, I saw this right away, and the uh, price was reasonable, so I went ahead and grabbed it. And uh, this is an earlier version of the stand. Uh, Delta made these, this one's welded construction. And later Delta made these with bolts in the corners so that you could take the legs off and it could be flat packed for shipping. Uh, but these welded ones were the earlier versions. And we had a little discussion on the OWWM forum of when Delta made that changeover from welded to bolted. And I think the consensus was around 1947 or 48 is when they stopped making these welded ones and which are the bolted version. So the scroll saw that I have is actually from the 30s. So this actually is a good match. It'll be period correct in terms of style. So I was glad to get this. This was the largest purchase I made at Iron Fest, uh, both in terms of size and cost. This is a South Bend nine inch metal lathe. This lathe was built in 1935, and it's what South Bend called a workshop lathe, workshop series lathe. Um, later, these were designated as model A, B, and C, but when they first came out, there was only one, one style, and that's this one, which later would have been called the model C, because it does not have the quick change gearbox at this end for threading, and it does not have the power cross feed. Uh, it has power longitudinal feed, through the uh, split nuts here, but it does not have the power cross feed or the quick change gearbox, which makes it a Model C. Um, this lathe has a 42 inch bed, three and a half foot bed. Um, comes with a three jaw chuck. It does have all the change gears for threading. So when you wanna make different thread pitches, you have to change out the gears at the end of the lathe here. Uh, I was glad to get these gears because often they get separated from the lathe and lost over the years. So glad to get those. Uh, it also came with a thread dial, which was a nice bonus because these were sold separately from the lathes. So not all the lathes you find have them. So that was a, a nice little plus. This lathe came out of an automotive repair shop. It was used primarily for turning armatures for starter motors and things like that. It doesn't have a lot of wear on the bed, which is nice to see, uh, especially for its age. It's in fairly good condition, just needs a little cleaning up. A little bit of flash rust on it on the bed that developed, actually I think probably when it was being transported because um, the person I bought it from had, had put a crate around it. He had built a crate for it and wrapped it in plastic but it was raining pretty heavily uh, on the trip back 
and I think some moisture got in there and it just was very humid and some flash rust developed on the ways so that should clean up fairly easily. Uh, came with the original counter shaft. This is the fixed counter shaft. South Bend had two models. This one is fixed. Uh, you have to loosen a couple bolts on the base and it's, it's got slotted holes in the base and you can slide it about an inch forward or back to loosen the tension to change the belts. The, uh, the other counter shaft is lever actuated. So there's a lever actually that, that releases the tension so you can change the belts. That one's more convenient, but this one works as well too. Um, this lathe is what's known as a top oiler. It has the oil ports on top of the headstock. Uh, later, South Bend moved these to the front of the headstock. So this is kind of a tip-off uh, of the age. That I think around 1939, they went to the front-mounted oilers, and that's when they also added the quick-change gearbox and the power cross-feed if you wanted those options. So um, I already have a South Bend 9-inch lathe, so the real reason I bought this one is because it came with quite a bit of tooling and a couple of uh, accessories that I didn't have. So I thought I would probably keep some of those and then clean up the lathe itself and then decide whether I want to keep the lathe or turn around and, and sell it to someone else that can, can use it. So we'll take a look at the uh, tooling that came with it down in the basement. All right, let's take a look at some of the tooling that came with that South Bend lathe. Uh, we'll start with these dog plates, drive plates, face plates, whatever you want to call them. Um, I got three different sizes with the lathe. They all fit the spindle. I believe this one is an original South Bend. Uh, this one might be two. It's about seven and a quarter, seven and a half inches in diameter. Not sure about this one, but it, it fits as well. So nice to have three different sizes just for various uh, different sizes of work you might be doing. And to go with the, with the dog plates, obviously you need dogs, drivers, so quite an assortment of those. Uh, I have some of these already, but it's always nice to have extras. I don't have one of this style. I don't know, it looks like some kind of a safety style. So that's different, at least. I also got an assortment of uh, lantern post style tool holders, Armstrong or Williams holders. Uh, we've got a knurling tool here, parting tool. This was a threading tool, but it doesn't have the cutter, so not much good for that one. Left hand tool, straight tool, boring bar holder, a couple of large boring bars to go with it. So always can use a few more of those. This is something kind of different. I, I don't have one of these. It is a uh, turret, a, a tailstock uh, turret tool post or tool holder, I guess. Um, you put, you can put different drill bits or different tools in these um, sockets here, and then it, there's like a quick release thing so that you can turn it to the next tool. Uh, used mostly for when you're doing a lot of repeat setups and production type work. I don't know that I'll use it much, but uh, I thought it was kind of different and interesting, so I'll play around with it and see if I like it. So I also got a uh, bull nose center for supporting pipe or hollow tubing. Just a typical dead center. Um, this is known as a crotch or V center. It uh, is used for if you want to cross drill round stock you can place the stock in this V and that way you can drill straight through the center of it. And got a drill chuck uh, with a key. I don't know what this is. Looks like it's an almond brand chuck so nothing too great here. These are kind of hard to find these crotch centers so that was a good good bonus there. Inside jaws for the three jaw chuck, nice to have. And then I got, there was this little Altoids tin, which I kind of wondered what was in there. And open it up and it's actually got the dauber for, um, the that goes the tailstock dauber. They used to use white lead to lubricate the tailstock centers. And these, there's a little hole on the tailstock that holds this, this little dauber and they're often missing, so it's kind of cool to see that. 
So one other thing that came with this lathe, I mentioned that it was used for turning armatures. Um, this is a undercutter, a mica undercutter that's used to uh, cut the mica in the commutators of, of electric motors. It's got a tiny little like saw blade on the end here. This, this is just a small motor and you set that up and run it back and forth over the mica to undercut it. Um, this actually looks like I think this is probably an Atlas part because Atlas made one of these mica undercutters as well. So this part looks Atlas and then it looks like somebody cobbled on uh, this this base here with this little spigot that'll fit onto a South Bend compound so that way you could use on your South Bend lathe as well. So kind of a neat little arrangement. I probably won't use this. Uh, I might clean it up and just pass it along so but still need to have. Something else I picked up. This this didn't actually come with the lathe. I, I bought it from another seller there. It's a uh, machine shop course put out by South, Lynn, South Bend Lathe Works. I think it was designed for schools and it, it has a number of projects of things you can make with your South Bend lathe. Starts with very simple things. A nail set here, punches, plumb bob, uh, turn your own tailstock and headstock centers, making a nut and a bolt. Just, just projects to kind of get you familiar with using a lathe. And then they get a little more advanced. A screwdriver, a C-clamp, machinist clamp. There was a couple at the end that were pretty cool. Yeah, a little, little machinist hammer. I thought that was kind of a neat project. So I don't know why I bought this other than I thought it was interesting to look at. I'll probably look through it a bit and I don't know, I may try making one of these if I have the time, so. I've got a few machinist chests already, uh, three or four, um, mostly Kennedy's. I've got a couple of, of wood mach machinist chests as well. But I saw this one at Iron Fest, and uh, at first when I saw it, I was excited because I thought it was a wood chest, but then when I got closer and looked at it, uh, I noticed that it's actually, um, made out of I think plywood but then everything is encased in tin or or uh, sheet metal and it's just painted to look like wood it's painted brown to give it a wood tone uh, inside the drawers are wood at least the fronts are oak and then I don't know the sides seem to be made out of fir or pine and the bottoms are just hardboard masonite um, hardware is kind of cheap on this. I didn't see a maker's name on it anywhere, so I don't know who made it. Obviously, it's not a Gerstner, but if any of you recognize this style and know who, who might have made it, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Um, it's in a little bit rough condition, probably needs to be refelted. Uh, all the drawers are there, though, and everything's no hardware is missing on it, so that was good. There's even a couple of rulers that I found wedged into in between some of the drawers and a drill bit there so I'll use this just to uh, probably store some miscellaneous tools and things like that that I don't have room for in the chest that I already own. I think the last purchase I made of the day was uh, a couple boxes of, of sharpening stones or hones here and if you've, if you've seen my other video on, on oil stones, you probably wonder what the heck I'm doing buying more, more hones, more sharpening stones. But I bought these two boxes because they, they had a couple of stones that I've always wanted to try. Uh, these here, these are, you can see they're kind of a two-tone. They're sort of a cream color on this side and a darker color on this side. These are known as uh, Belgian cotecules, and they're a natural stone that is mined or quarried in, in Belgium, obviously. Um, they're used by, they're you're used as hones for razors, straight razors. And the straight razor fanatics really love these. I've never had one to try out, so I don't know how well they'll work on woodworking tools, but I've always wanted to get my hands on one just to say that I've tried them. So a couple here, I think this one has been glued together, but this is a natural one. It Actually, the layers of of uh, stone it, it forms this way I don't know how what causes it to 
make this kind of layered look but they act, that's actually how they come out of the out of the ground so kind of cool here's a smaller piece i don't know if you can see it but it's been worn a hollow worn in i guess from stropping a razor on it repeatedly back and forth so another little one here uh, most of these hones are natural stones i believe i don't know what they are it's hard for me to tell um, a lot some of them are in boxes this one's kind of a blue gray this is more of a sandstone i don't know what that is but most of them look like they're natural a few of them i think are man-made this one looks like it might be a synthetic stone and then there's you know just a couple of typical combination oil stones crystal on stone here and i don't know another one here so not too excited about those here's a couple more uh, razor hones for straight razors i don't use a straight razor myself i use double-edged uh, razor blades but guys that are into the straight razors use these quite a bit again more more hones and stones I, I don't know what these are like i said um, there were a few of these pieces of soapstone and that this can be used as a marker uh, it'll mark on dark surfaces you can make a mark that way with the soapstone so often used for stuff like that like i said probably more stuff that i won't use but uh I think I paid ten dollars for all of these and I really bought them just to get these Belgian codicules so I'm going to try these out and see how they do. On Saturday night at Arnfest there's always a banquet and as part of that banquet there's a live auction of larger tools that have been donated and then there's also a silent auction for smaller items that are donated and they're on they're set up on tables all around the room so People go around and bid on the silent auction items and then they call, call the bidding off at a certain point. And this is one of the items that I got in the silent auction. It's a Craftsman six inch bench grinder. Um, it doesn't have any grinding wheels on it, but it's a quarter horse motor. Not, not real powerful, but good enough for just a six inch. I'm probably gonna use it with a wire wheel and a deburring wheel. Uh, it doesn't have covers on the ends here and it was made that way so it makes me a little bit nervous to use a grinding wheel in case it would shatter or something so it'd feel a little better just using something like a wire wheel uh, this one's nice because it's very complete it has the glass shields here and it has the tool rests so that was nice um, this is made in 1959 and most of the craftsman tools you see are gray this one's a goldish color, gold here and kind of a brown here. And in 1959, Craftsman changed the color. I think it was their 50th anniversary. So they came out with this color scheme. They called it Power Bronze. And you'll see that every once in a while with uh, table saws and other tools from that 1959-1960 era. So kind of kind of unique, different. So uh, kind of happy to get that one. One of the other items that I bought at the silent auction is this inside um, measuring device. It's made by Lufkin, and I really like Lufkin tools, so when I saw that, I decided to put in a bid on it. No one else outbid me, so I came home with it. Uh, the way it works, it's, it's a two-part rule, and it's connected here with these little sliders. So you put it inside a cabinet or a doorway, or opening and you slide it until each end meets the edges of the opening and then you take a reading here so this front piece is two feet and then you can see this end measures from uh, right to left so as, it, as you slide it out it increases so that would be like two feet and eight inches you add the inches to the feet here so kind of different uh, I don't see these too often this one's not in the greatest of shape it got wet at some point so it, it's pretty warped I might try to see if I can straighten that out but anyways I thought it was kind of cool and, and different so I went ahead and picked that up every year it seems like I pick up a uh, freebie or two at Iron Fest and this year was no exception 
Uh, I got to talking to a guy there that has an Atlas milling machine just like mine and he had purchased a bunch of milling cutters and had some extras so he gave me a couple here that he knew would fit my machine so that was nice of him. And then uh, I've got a friend in town here his name is Todd and he was also happened to be at Iron Fest and he recently has set up a furnace a, a uh, smelting furnace so that he's melting uh, scrap metal aluminum brass copper and he had melted a bunch of aluminum and made these bricks or blocks of aluminum and he had a few extra with him so he gave me one um, not sure what I'm gonna do with it, it makes a nice door stop right now but I might throw it up on the mill and just uh, surface it just to get it nice and smooth and shiny but it's kind of cool so that was nice of him to give me that so Anyway, that's it for Arnfest 2019. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video and thanks for watching.